Hello everyone and welcome to uh, the Full Throttle Alchemist 1017 update video as well as a slight tutorial on how to use the API which as of this version has been refactored and you will need to use this particular version of the API. Uh, there were some specifics that people pointed out to me that uh, didn't work well and actually pretty much prevented people from using it so I fixed those as of this version so that's why I'm doing this now. So updating from uh, 16 to 17, there aren't really any new features, but there are several bug fixes. And uh, I actually did make it so that the update notification will actually only show once per user. So it won't always yell at you every time you start it up. If you want the full change log, of course, you can check the website as always. Now, if you downloaded the newest API, you'll see it has all of the classes that are listed here. And these are the only ones that are included in the API. I uh, made certain this time that I wasn't referencing anything in my code directly so that it doesn't need my code to function, which is very important for an API. Now what we have here is one main class here, FTAAPI.java, and this is the one that you're going to call when you want to do anything with Full Throttle Alchemist. So if you want to add something, you see all these methods over here, add element provider, add recipe, this is an atelier recipe. Uh, grinding freezing recipes and a few extra functions here that may not be uh, they may not recognize what they do immediately fortunately I took the time to comment pretty effectively the entire API so if you're already pretty well versed in Minecraft mods and you just read the comments you'll probably get this without without much of an issue but here I'm going to show uh, just a few examples of how to add elements to something and how to add a recipe now I'm going to have, of course, be using my mod that I already have an Eclipse environment for, but you can do this in your own mod as well. Now I recommend that you do this, wherever you do this, you do this in some post init method. So I'm just going to make myself a new plugin. Uh, a plugin is just an, an internal thing that I made to be more organized. Plugin API example. Alright, so this is all internal, so it doesn't really matter how I did this, but I've just made it so that this particular plugin API example will now load with post init. It will actually load at the end of everything else, all of my other code. So this is actually a great example because this is exactly what will happen if you load your mod post init after Full Throttle Alchemist, which I would definitely recommend. Right, so we've got our mod, we've got our code, we've got our post init method. What do we want to do with the API? Well, let's say we wanted to add some elements to an item. So elements in Full Throttle Alchemist are based on the periodic tables elements. So if you don't know what those are, you're going to need to pull up an actual periodic table and familiarize yourself with that. So I'm just going to take something that by default doesn't have any elements on it. I'm going to take, say, Bedrock, and that is sufficient as there's no meta on Bedrock. And elements in this particular framework work by using a hash map of string and floats. So, hash map of string and float. Obviously, for this example, I'm going to assume you are relatively familiar with Java. I won't be teaching you that here. So we've got our hash map, and I'm going to put some carbon on it. I'm going to put two grams of carbon on it. So all you do is you assign a float value, which is the amount in grams that the particular element has, to a string, which is just the capitalized version of the name of the element, in this case carbon, and a little bit of boron, which uh, is a bad example, but you can do. It's a bad example because I don't use boron anywhere. If you're going to add a new element, you may want to add something to use it for. At the moment, boron would just be additional garbage. It's not one of the 12 or so elements that's actively used. But now that you have an item stack and a hash map for the ingredients that are, should be on that item stack, we need to make a bit of a framework of our own here to get this to work. So we now have, in this class, a hash map that uses item stacks as a key, and as its data, has a hash map of string and float. So what we're going to do is we're going to take element data dot put and we're going to put bedrock stack and ingredients in there and that's going to be one entry. Now you may wonder what is this data structure for? Well, to add an element to something it's not just as simple as calling one method and throwing something through it. The way that I implemented it is you have to add something called an element provider and you have to call this method in the API which means we need to implement the iElementProvider interface in our class. Now the only method in here is this one, getElements. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take our uh, particular class, and you could do this anywhere, but for simplicity's sake, I'm simply going to use this particular class that I'm using at the moment. I wouldn't recommend you use your main class. So we're going to implement I element provider, and we're going to put that method in here. Now, even though this is an example, I still want this to be relatively clean. So I'm actually going to make a sub method for the add elements, and I'm just going to call it and post in it. And now that we have this little guy down here, which at the moment is returning null, we will want to call FTA API dot add element provider this because this is actually implementing it. If we were using something else, we would pass that into it. Now, once we have the element provider added, we'd rather not return null. Personally, when it's a code that's going to run multiple times, I like to be a bit safer and use some try catch. You may actually want to catch something here, but at the moment, this particular thing is only going to run whenever an element is checked, meaning that it's not a good idea to allow this thing to crash, so I'm putting it in the try catch, since this thing is going to run a lot. So what we have here is it's giving up, this method is giving us an item stack, and we are supposed to return the elements on that item stack. You see here, it's in the format of string and float. Now, the thing about item stacks is they are, of course, an object, and we can't simply ask the hash map for this exact object right here because it's not the same. So what we have to do is we have to say, is this equivalent to the item that I have stored in here? So what we're going to do is since we have a hash map of our data up here, element data, so what we need to do here is we need to get the iterator of the element data's key set, which is going to essentially just be a set of item stacks. But we want the iterator of that, and now we have an iterator of item stacks right here. This is how I'm going to choose to do this. And it, your, your complete setup could be different. This is just the first way I've thought of to do this. Since we are using an iterator, we're just going to do the standard while has next. All right, so check stack equals iter.next. And here's where we are going to check our data, each individually, against the data that it's giving us. We're going to ignore any null stacks and simply continue on the next iteration. Before I forget, if stack is equal to null, then we should just return null, because if the stack itself is null, that would both be a problem for our logic, and it would also all, and it would also be null element, so we may as well return null. So we're going to say if check stack.getItem is equal to stack.getItem, these are the same item, so we can safely assert that these are now that this item is now equivalent, which means that since we found a match, we now want to return the element data that's stored in this particular iteration. So what we're going to want to do is get the hash map. We're going to call element data dot get, and the actual object is check stack. So since that's the actual object, calling that will give us the actual data stored. And now all we have to do is return stored elements. And since we went ahead and make it a very made it a variable, make sure that it's not null which shouldn't really be necessary, but whatever. So with this, we have a framework by which all we have to do is add more things in this method and the elements should be represented here. Now let me go ahead and test this. All right, here we are in a test world. We need to check that bedrock has elements on it. And it does, it has carbon, oxygen, and boron on it in the exact amounts that we specified. So our framework works. All right, so just to make sure that this is working properly, I went ahead and not only added some elements to bedrock, but a few to lapis ore and redstone ore. These are blocks I just chose because they don't have elements on them by default. I wouldn't recommend adding elements to these particular things, especially ore. It would become uh, rather exploitable if ore was transmutable in any way. All right, so it looks like bedrock has the elements, redstone ore has the elements, and lapis lazuli ore has the elements that we specified. So this framework does indeed work. If you want to use this framework for your mod, I could recommend it. It does seem to work rather effectively. Now, to be fair, this is something you're only going to want to do for new items. Adding elements in this way, using the iElement provider, is only going to work for items that don't already have elements. If they already have elements on them, this will be ignored. The only way at the moment to overwrite default elements is to modify the element text file manually. This API is meant for add-ons to my mod, not rewrites. Now, while this framework is entirely extensible, it's also quite verbose, and you might not necessarily need to go to this 
length. So let's say instead of using this framework at all, we no longer need to even call add elements. While we're in this method, all we would have to do is say if stack dot get item is equal to item dot get item from block, since this is a block, blocks dot bedrock, then we could safely assume that this is in fact bedrock and do this manually this way by returning a new hash map that we make right here. You'll have to decide for yourself which way you want to do. But as long as you return a hash map of string and float from this method, whatever given item stack is passed through will have those elements, as long as there aren't already elements for that particular stack. And of course, if you want to go into the tag data of the item, in case you made a very specific item, you can also determine what elements it would have based on the tag data. Again, just return whatever you need to from this method. All right, so now that we have elements down, how do we add a recipe for something in the atelier? Well, we just added elements to bedrock. Let's add a recipe for bedrock. Seems like a good example. So to add a recipe for something in the atelier, you need a few different options. You need a few different objects. Basically, we're going to call FTAAPI.addRecipe, and it needs to extend recipe. And this recipe is PAAPI recipe, which is a custom class that I made. Now, this class is abstract, so you can't actually instantiate recipe, but you can, and I would recommend, instantiating basic recipe, which extends recipe. Now, if you've used this API before, this is one of the things I refactored quite a bit recently. There was some extra data in here from the system that I ported this from when I, put it, when I moved this over to Minecraft, and there was just a bunch of extra data that we did not need. And that's one of the reasons why it's important that you update to the newest API. As far as I'm aware, I should not have to change this again. So we basically just need to call FTAAPI.addRecipe, new basic recipe, which we're going to have to make an object of now. Let's see, basic recipe. Well, hash map is string and float. It's the elements required to craft the recipe. An item stack output, which is the default output the recipe will create. The name, of the recipe, which is which must be a unique identifier, and an array list of item stacks called chances. So what we're going to need is we're going to need the information that we want Bedrock to have. Well, let's uh, use a little bit of our own framework to get that. Let's call our own get elements method, and that should get us the ingredients we need. So let's pass in the ingredients. The next was the item stack, so we'll pass in an item stack of Bedrock. We'll need a unique identifier. Here's something I can recommend. If you have a particular mod name, for me, I've been using PA for Project Alchemy, so I'll, be, I'll go PA underscore. I would recommend suffixing this particular name with that all of the time. These all need to be unique identifiers, or they won't work. I'm just going to call this PA Bedrock. And I'm going to put chances in here, which is going to be array list of item stack. Now, whatever we put in this array list is going to have the option, the ability to allow research of that item to give us this recipe. Now, given this configuration, the chance is going to be based on the ratio of elements in the object and in the recipe. If it's one for one, it should be a 100% chance. And if we just add bedrock here to the array list, what this should do is by researching Bedrock, we can get the recipe for Bedrock, which will use the exact elements that Bedrock has on it natively. Now, of course, there's no way to actually get Bedrock, so we'll go ahead and add Cobblestone as a possible chance to get Bedrock. All right, so now if we take a research vellum, research Bedrock, hopefully we should get this, and there it is, the Bedrock recipe, which we just added and we can now make again. And there it is, that's, that's it, that's how you add a recipe. It's really that simple. Now, of course, you could tweak this any way you want, but if you add a new item in your mod and you want a way to transmute it, that's how you add that. You can add the elements and a way to transmute it, and it'll work just fine. I feel like that's the bulk of the API, and while there is, while there's also a function to add grinding and freezing recipes, these are pretty straightforward and don't really take the setup that the other things do. I hope this tutorial helped you. If it did, leave a like and a comment. And if you need more help, or if you simply want to notify me of an add-on that you've made for Full Throttle Alchemist, 
please go to forum.ftamod.com. I check that forum every day, and it's a great way to get in touch with me. Also, if you want to support me, please go over to my Patreon and become a patron. Every little bit helps, and without enough support, I'm not going to be able to continue making this. And if you can't support me monetarily, then please, watch my videos, share them with your friends, and let's bring some new blood to this channel.